very good afternoon to all of you on behalf of sri lanka medical association and world health organization i welcome everyone for this series of webinars on covid-19 management and prevention this series of webinars is conducted in collaboration with slma as well as world health organization with the expertise from professional colleges and association the first of this series of webinars is on a very important topic that is guidance on ipc strategies which is very much needed and very relevant during this time period during this webinar the resource persons will be from sri lanka college of microbiologist and i welcome all the resource persons and also my co chair professor adira karnavira who is the new president of sri lanka college of microbiologist to conduct this session and introduce resource persons i hand over to professor adira karnavira and uh, or to professor adira thank you indika very warm welcome to this webinar from me also uh, and it's a pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the session uh, consultant microbiologist dr madhumani abewardana she is currently working at the sirimau bandanaik specialized children hospital in kendi uh, prior to that she has worked in many hospitals across across the country uh, in batiklo nuarelia uh, mathale that is after she returned uh, in year 2014 completing her tra training at the university hospitals in leicester uk she remains a very active member of our college and in fact is one of the joint secretaries of the current council her active role as a consultant microbiologist is significant uh, and she has taken on uh, many tasks that she has successfully completed which includes her role in the preparation of the infection control and prevention guidelines related to covid-19 which makes her an ideal speaker at this event so without further ado let me call upon uh, dr madhubani abewardana to uh, start her presentation over to you madhubani thank you uh, good afternoon to all the participants today uh, first of all i must thank uh, the slme and who for organizing such an important event uh, to update healthcare workers on infection and prevention in covid situation and uh, as a, a member of sri lanka college of microbiologist it's my great pleasure and i'm i really thankful for giving me this uh, real great opportunity so this is the high time to talk about uh, personal protective equipment in infection prevention and controlling covid situation because we are facing a huge problem uh, in actually in all the world so just telling about covid 19 uh, is an virus is an encapsulated rna virus with a lipid layer so it is important in destructing it to know that it is a lipid layer because we can destroy it with alcohol as well as with soap and water so uh, as healthcare workers we have to work with patients with with or without covid so what we need to know how to protect us ourselves from getting infected so that's why we have personal protective equipment ppe for healthcare workers protection to prevent infection considering the mode of transmission that we have to consider always and the route if worn correctly that is the main import, most important thing actually although we have the things if you don't it you don't use it correctly there's no point so we have different types of uh, personal protective equipment gloves to gown to boots and we will talk about them so before uh, going into uh, prevention we should know the transmission mode of transmission of covid uh, 19 so mainly droplet as we know uh, by infected individuals through cough or sneezing and then contact precautions direct or indirect contact with person respiratory secretions and airborne transmission which is being talked now uh, because it can be medically uh, induced aerosol generation or we suspect some aerosols are uh, there in uh, humid 
closed uh, BC environment as well. So in prevention, we have to, in, as healthcare workers in hospital, we have to always follow standard precaution. That is, that is a must. And then of course, we have to consider the appropriate transmission-based precautions. It could be a contact precaution, it could be a droplet, it could be airborne. So apart from that, appropriate disinfection practice as well. So a standard precaution, just to remind you, as we know um, what is standard precaution, mainly hand hygiene, uh, personal protective equipment, what we are going to talk today, respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, safe injection practice and sharp safety, linen and patient care equipment cleaning, environmental cleaning and waste disposal. So we have to consider in any infection, uh, we have to follow standard precaution. But in COVID, we have to consider the mode of transmission, how to prevent them. So droplet transmission, droplet precautions, we have to keep a gap. We should have at, at least minimum one meter distance from each other not to get infected. Apart from that, if you are going closer to wear a mask. And in contact precautions, uh, direct not to touch anything, avoid touching and washing your hands, either using water or you can use alcohol hand rub. And in contact precautions, it could be indirect as well. You, uh, the, uh, oh, the surfaces containing organisms, COVID including, you sh if, I mean, we can't avoid touching surfaces always, but try to avoid as much as possible. But if you touch any surface, it's, bet it's always you should clean your hands before touching your face. Again, you can use alcohol hand rub or hand wash, uh, washing hands. And the third, uh, for, uh, the other thing is uh, getting prevented from airborne precautions. In, uh, in the community, of course, try not to be in uh, covered, non aerated places. But in the hospitals, we have to consider because we have to do aerosol generating procedures to treat patients where you have to follow uh, the guidelines and you have to use the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment. At the moment, I'm telling appropriate, but we are going to uh, talk about each and everything in next slides. So droplet precautions. Can it, it is, you, uh, we have to avoid droplets. It's better to have a single patient, a single room for a patient, or at least we have to keep minimum one meter distance from each other because droplets drops within one meter or maximum two meters. So apart from that personal protective equipment, we have to use a medical mask, eye protection, goggles, face shield, and a gown. Because we should not, and we, it is not recommended to wear everything everywhere. That's why we are talking about what we should wear at a particular in, uh, situation. So in uh, droplets, we need to have a mask, goggles to cover our eyes or face shield and a gown. And we have to limit movements of the patients as well. In contact precautions, again, single room is a better place. And uh, of course, hand hygiene, following five moments of hand hygiene, WHO five moments. And here, gloves and gown, because it is the contact. But wearing gloves all the time will not uh, give any protection, actually, it will uh, worsen the situation. Uh, all the uh, personal protective equipment we should wear when indicated and discard when the procedure is over. So here, gloves, gown, and uh, is important and equipment cleaning, disinfection and sterilization is equally important. And environmental cleaning, especially high touched area should be cleaned frequently to uh, avoid uh, contact. Airborne precautions. In hospitals, because we have to do some procedures where the aerosols are generated, such as bronchoscopy, open suctioning, nebulization, tracheostomy, and so on. I actually, although uh, sample collection is not considered as a um, aerosol generating procedure, we practice taken it as a aerosol generating procedure as well. So here again, 
have to have a single room and an adequate ventilation. It could be either a negative pressure room, which is not available in Sri Lanka, most in many hospitals. And uh, of course, we can have natural ventilation with a very good airflow. And uh, in airborne, airborne precautions, PPE, we have something little further. Like we need to have PPE in 95 or FFP2 or equal mask and eye protect, uh, protection using face shield or goggles with a gown uh, and boots. So rational and correct use of PPE. PPE can reduce exposure to patho pathogens if we use it correctly and rationally. Again, I'm telling because some at the beginning of COVID situation, people wanted to wear everything at all the time. Like they wanted N95 mask and uh, I mean, at every moment, like even walking in the town, you must have seen people wearing N95 mask. But what you need to do, rationally use it and correctly. The effectiveness of PP strongly depend on staff training on putting and removing PPE, it's very important. And uh, access to the sufficient supply. We had problems at the beginning when the COVID was just uh, coming, but now at least we are having some uh, uh, enough uh, supply. And appropriate hand hygiene, we should never forget about hand hygiene because our hands carry so many organisms, not to only COVID. And healthcare worker compliance, you have to teach them and get the compliance and regular monitoring and feedback by infection prevention and control personnel. Because people train to forget because we were more aware and we were more careful in January, February than now. You may see that people are getting a little relaxed, which is not correct because it is high time that you have to be really careful about your uh, wearing PPE and other infection prevention measures. So uh, in rational PPE use, we have to assess the risk exposure and the extent of contact. It could be respiratory droplets, respiratory droplets, blood, body fluid, open skin. Depending on that, you have to choose what is necessary. PPE item to wear based on this assessment. Be, be, when you consider that, you will choose whether you need a mask or respirator, gown or overall, gloves, goggle or face shield or boots. So anyway, before perf uh, any, any PPE, you have to perform hand hygiene according to the WHO five moments because your hands should be always clean and should be done at each and every patient. So examples of, examples of PPE. Uh, which are used in healthcare settings for COVID-19. So to cover the body, we can have gowns. To cover our hands, we can have uh, gloves. They, are, they don't have to be sterile gloves. We can use disposable gloves. And medical masks to cover nose and mouth, not one of those or just a chin. And a respirator, N95 or equal FFP2, because we have uh, different safety uh, stages. So we have to either have N95 mask or equal means that in Europe it is FFP2 or similar to cover nose and mouth again. And a face shield uh, or goggles. Face shield covers eyes, nose and mouth, which gives kind of better protection uh, but goggles will cover eyes as well. So just to give us kind of, because we are, we are always talking about masks and respirators, thought of giving little um, idea about mask and respirators. So we, we call all masks, but there are masks and respirators which cover nose and mouth. Masks are loose fitting ones, where respirators are tightly fit the face. That is the most important part of respirators. So mask could be face mask, fabric mask and all, and surgical mask. The most main difference is surgical mask has got some um, impermeability character. 
So when we are talking about respirators, there are so many different respirators uh, for gas emissions. When we use it uh, as gas mask, self-contained breathing apparatus, air line uh, uh, respirators, but we are talking about particulate respirators, which are available again, uh, you can uh, group them into three groups, disposable filtering uh, face piece respirators, or you can call it air purifying respirators. There are nine types and reusable uh, elastometric respirators and powered air purifying respirators, battery powered. So what really we see is the first one, disposable filtering face piece, uh, face piece respirators or air purifying respirators, which one of those is N95 we all know about. So these are the things we need in healthcare setting. So these are a few pictures. This is a medical or surgical mask. And this is an example for N95 or equal mask. And this is the elast uh, elastometric respirator. And this is a uh, powered purifying respirator. We, uh, we don't have it at the moment, but it is a very good thing when you work with, directly working with uh, patients with COVID uh, in wards and uh, in hospitals. So this is a full PP just to show you what, what are the items. A95 respirator, goggles, head cover to cover your head, impermeable gown, gloves, and the apron. So general guidelines on use of PPE. It should be appropriate, and we have to follow hand hygiene, uh, frequent hand and uh, hygiene and respiratory hygiene always. Perform hand hygiene before donning, putting one, and after doffing. PPE should be removed immediately after the procedure is completed. We should not hang around with the PPE on if we have worn it for special procedure. Discard PPE in an appropriate waste container, close pin with a yellow bag. Even a mask having beyond the recommended activity will lead to higher chances of mishandling. You may have seen people meddling with the mask, pulling it below the nose, or all the type of hanging it on your neck, or kind of things, which will cause real harms. And you may have seen masks on tables and everywhere. You never remember, this is the one we have to always consider. We have worn it because due to a purpose to cover ourselves, to protect from germs. So this, this contains germs. So if you keep it on tables, chairs and everywhere, you contaminate whole surfaces. So use of appropriate personal protective equipment again, when Exam, example, uh, where droplet transmission is suspected. This is an, just an example. So when droplets, then of course, what medical mask? If droplet transmission suspected, you don't have to wear a N95 respirator. And how? Following the, check the picture. So how to wear a medical mask? safely. You have to wash your hands, inspect the mask for tears and uh, holes, check the top side with the metal part, ensure the colored side out. Now I think we all know but we there have been some uh, discussions with the blue side out or white side out. Now we know that blue side always out. Place the metal piece uh, or stiff edge on your nose, uh, cover, <coughs> cover your mouth, nose, and chin properly. Adjust the mask to your face without leaving gaps. You have to adjust it. And avoid touching the mask afterward. Remove the mask from behind ears uh, and keep it away from you when you discard and discard the mask immediately after use to a close pin and wash your hands. Because although you touch your part, the, still the mask could be contaminated. What you don't you should not do that is do not use ripped or damp, damp, uh, damp mask. Do not wear the mask only over the mouth or nose. These are the good, uh, we see this happening all the time on the TV especially. Do not wear a loose mask 
it will not protect you. Do not touch the front of the mask. Do not remove the mask to talk to someone. You may have seen that when people go, need, so you may think about this fish market thing, uh, which was a huge problem previously. Just imagine, because be, people were, were, I think, and I, uh, I, I think I'm correct, were talking to each other, pulling the mask, because it's a very noisy place where you talk very noisily, making many droplets and uh, because people can't hear you you pull the mask and you try to lip read the uh, fissure and uh, windows or somebody and uh, so it's humid and there, there have been so many uh, possibilities why all the people kind of all the people in the fish market were the infection so and they do not leave your mask unattended here and there, so the people can get contaminated and do not reuse the mask. Medical masks are not supposed to be reused. No mask can protect you if you wear it incorrectly, because we can't say, we, I was wearing a mask, but I got this, because check whether you have worn it correctly and uh, maintained it correctly. So when aerosol, uh, aerosols are generated, you have to have an N95 mask or if you have to get the mask, put it on using the loops and then seal. This is the most important part because you may have seen people with mask hanging on the face like a shell, uh, no fitting at all, which is useless. So do the seal check before you uh, enter the patient's room. You have to seal, positive seal check, exhale sharply, exhale sharply and feel whether you you can feel the air coming out of the mask through the caps. No leak, no leak. To make sure no leakage, if leakage, adjust the straps tightly, reset the seal. And negative seal check, inhale well, inhale deeply, then you will feel that the mask is hanging onto your uh, face. If one in, if one in 90 might, in 95 mask without a seal, no protection because air will go through all the gaps onto your, onto your, into you uh, and uh, that they will get, enter your nose and mouth. So initial fit testing is in, in the prior. We have fit testing for masks, but in most hospitals, we don't have that facility in Sri Lanka, but at least we can do the seal test, which we can, anyone can do. Uh, it is critical uh, when you put on a partic uh, particulate respirator should always perform the required seal check to ensure there's no leak. You may have seen people wearing initially surgical masks and on, the, on top of that, they wear a N95 mask or K95 mask. What is the purpose? There's no, uh, no I mean, there's no use actually because you are making a space for air to get into your uh, nose or mouth. Note that if the wearer has a beard or other thick facial hair, again, it will not protect you. You may have seen these pictures some time ago, like, uh, which beard you prefer to have if you want to wear N95 mask. So this beard you can't have because it will come out of the mask, but this beard uh, you can have because they are inside the uh, mask. But when you te tell these things to people, they just smile and ignore. That is a problem. You don't take things serious. Now it is high time to take things seriously and especially about personal protective equipment as healthcare workers. So this is steps. We have to follow the steps. We have to check because, and we have to have somebody with us to check whether we are doing the correct thing when we are putting the PPE. So you have to remove all the things like bangles and all, and you can have the scrub suit with boots and move to the clean area and start on, uh, wash your hands and put on your gloves and then put the gown on and then the mask. And then shield and goggles. There's a way because then you it is, it is easier and health, uh, safer to remove them if you put them correctly in, in an order. And, uh, and then head and neck cover and ultimately waterproof apron and put on the, sorry, put the uh, gloves, second pair of gloves here. And then uh, we can proceed. 
Here, when you remove them, always clean your hands on gloves. You have two pair of two pairs of gloves. Perform hand hygiene and tear the apron. You have to remove the apron from the behind. Don't ever touch the front because front is the most contaminated part. You pull it from the behind and roll it without touching the front side and perform hand hygiene on gloved hands and remove outer pair. So we remove the apron and we clean our hands uh, and remove the first pair of gloves and perform hand hygiene. And we then move to uh, head and neck cover. We remove it, again perform hand hygiene on gloved hands and we move to the gown. Gown again from behind, you have to loose the straps and take it out, not touching the front. You roll it in a way so that you will touch only inner side of the gown and roll it and put into the required bin. And then eye protector and again wash the hands because you are going to touch your face kind of. Uh, you ultimately you remove the uh, mask. Uh, when you remove the mask, uh, bend a little so that uh, there won't be any kind thing coming onto you um, when you are removing the uh, mask. And again, perform hand hygiene and remove the second glove pair. So this is very important because it is more important than do donning. Doffing is the most important because your PPE contaminated. So you have to take very them take off them very carefully. So minimum PPE, we have some in different settings, we have different types of uh, PPE. Uh, in a triage, where you don't go near to the near the patient, uh, medical mask will be enough. But uh, since uh, the patient might come near you, you may have a you may have a face shield. In emergency treatment, providing care to a patient with respiratory symptoms within one meter, within one meter. Uh, you have to have the ma medical mask, gown, gloves, apron, and eye protection. Emergency procedures such as intubation, where there will be aerosol generation, there, of course, you have to have a NIOSH approved N95 or equally uh, equal mask with an impermeable gown. So here the full PPE, so-called full PPE. In the emergency treatment, when you do the... Uh, aerosol generating procedure, when the cleaner comes, cleaner also, the, uh, the initial guidelines said that surgical mask would be enough, but since there will be aerosols in the environment, uh, new guidelines says a new approved N95, we should uh, give to the cleaner as well with impermeable gown, heavy duty gloves, eye protection, boots or closed work shoes with a surgical cap or surgical hood. And uh, in a patient room with COVID patients, healthcare worker providing direct care to the patient. Initially, again, we had surgical mask here, but now it is removed and now we, uh, we have replaced it with a 95O equal mask with impermeable gown. I mean, kind of full, full PPE apart from the apron. Uh, we are aerosol generating procedure apart from these items, full PPE plus apron. And when you transport medical mask gloves, this is why, because we don't have to wear everything all the time. We have to consider what kind of risk, then you have to choose the PPE accordingly. Healthcare worker transporting medical mask gloves, cleaners entering the room of COVID-19 patient, new approved in 95 or PPE again as previously. And uh, then again, uh, patient with fever, suspected but not confirmed, uh, within one, uh, beyond one meter, you can have a surgical mask uh, and plus you can have a shield. Uh, not really necessary unless you go near. Uh, within one meter surgical mask, eye protection, gown, gloves, apron, uh, aerosol generating procedure as we discussed earlier, full set of PPE. Uh, patient room wards, patient without fever or respiratory symptoms. They don't cough or uh, sneeze. Uh, so providing care beyond one meter, maintains a distance of one meter, surgical mask, because now we have moved to surgical mask uh, to be worn by everybody. So 
in the healthcare system. So it is a must. Providing care within one meter distance, surgical medical mask plus, plus shield to cover your eyes also. Uh, providing care via aerosol generating procedure without fever or respiratory symptoms. You can have medical mask, gown, gloves, apron, and eye protection. You don't have to always wear when you don't suspect or the patient does not have respiratory symptoms or fever. Outpatient facilities in OPD and all. Physical examination of patient with respiratory symptoms, surgical mask, gown, gloves, and eye protection because you may go near. Physical examination uh, of patients without respiratory sy symptoms, surgical masks will be enough. And cleaners after be and between consultation, surgical masks, fluid resistant gown, heavy duty gloves, eye protection if there will be any splashes, boots or closed shoes for them. And ambulance or transit vehicles, healthcare workers transporting patients uh, suspected to have COVID, surgical mask or new approved N95 mask, impermeable gown because you go in a vehicle, so that's why in new approved N95 mask, uh, impermeable go gl uh, gown, gloves, side protection, and the driver if he, he doesn't go uh, he, with, with a separate uh, compartment with distance. Now, we, as we all wear surgical masks, he can be given a surgical mask as well. But those who are helping to pay, helping patient to get down, uh, better to have a surgical mask, impermeable gown, gloves, and eye protection. Cleaners cleaning after and between transport, surgical mask, impermeable gown, maybe to say, because here you don't have to, because you keep the uh, vehicle shutters open for a while before cleaning. You don't have to have a N95 mask for this, uh, cleaners because it's it's an open place where you don't need to give uh, N95 mask. So extended use and pre-processing of PP because considering that several groups we know that we don't have we know that we don't have N95 mask. So there is a shortage. So we the WHO recommends extended use or reprocess. Extended use means you can use mask not mask respirators. If you use for a short while, you can use your respirator for another five times roughly. You have to keep it in a separate breathable paper bag or something with your name and all, not to contaminate inside and out. So your outer side is contaminated. So you should not touch outside and inside to contaminate it. And reprocessing is also is being done. You can reprocess N95 mask using a hydrogen peroxide of uh, vapors. It also is being done because we have a shortage and all efforts should be taken to provide adequate amount with all the things we have to have to protect the healthcare worker. We have to have personal protective equipment. And en engineering control such as the last barriers and all we can uh, reduce the usage, usage of uh, personal protective equipments. Uh, summary, rational use of PP means always practice hand hygiene. I'll always follow guidelines according to the healthcare setting. So where you work, you have to choose your PPE. PPE are in global shortage, be responsible for rational use, assess the risk exposure PP only when, the, when it is necessary. Don't use them. Uh, unnecessarily and use them correctly. You may have seen, these are from real life. So you see, so these things you should avoid. We have to learn how to use at least mask. When you, if you want to have a cup of tea, don't, if you are going to reuse it, put into a uh, paper bag or you can fold the tissue or paper and keep your folded mask inside. When you fold it, always fold it inside out like this, not the blue side, blue side always out. So inside out so that this is your, uh, this is your germ and you can put into a bag or something like this and keep and use it afterwards after your cup of tea. Use your PPE correctly to save you and others. Thank you and uh, stay safe.
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madhubani, uh, for that very informative talk. I'm sure there will be loads of questions uh, on the chat. Uh, please check it. Uh, I'm sure there will be time uh, at the end of the session to answer those. So let me go straight to the second speaker of this session, Dr. Lasanti Bhagya Piyasiri, uh, who is also a clinical microbiologist who is currently working at the teaching hospital Karapitiya. Uh, she has also worked in different parts of the country, including Poland Narva, since her return from her training at uh, University of Leicester, UK in 2014. Again, she is an active member of our college who continues to make uh, valuable contributions. Over to you, Bhagya. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, for that kind introduction. That uh, I'm grateful for uh, arranging this uh, important webinar uh, to SLMA and WHO in collaboration with uh, our College of Microbiologists. Uh, so this is, uh, we heard the lecture on PP from Dr. Madhumani. And this is actually, uh, I'm speaking about hospital preparedness uh, for COVID pandemic, the infection control aspects. And uh, the, this is actually, this lecture is meant to uh, meant for the hospitals where the, the positive COVID patients are not occupied. Uh, the, the, that's the majority of hospitals in Sri Lanka. Uh, but uh, there are some parts you can use for COVID treatment centers as well. So why we should have a preparation of hospitals? One thing we know that uh, seeing the number of patients coming to the hospitals, it's difficult to control the number of uh, uh, patients coming to the hospitals. Yeah, actually, patients should have the freedom to seek care they needed without the fear of getting the disease uh, uh, in the hospital. Then the hospital staff should have the safety assurance, guidance, and required facilities. Thirdly, should minimize unnecessary expenditure and reduce waste of resources and also need collaboration of the administrators with all the staff and authorities. Uh, I have uh, divided this into three main areas. One thing is you have to uh, think of the safety of the patients and the safety of the healthcare workers, and you have to have an emergency preparedness with special facilities. Safety of the patients, you should have filtering, high-risk isolation, Diagnostics, action, action plan, surveillance, regular reviews, and healthcare worker safety all about, plus others, and emergency preparedness for ICUs, OT, uh, operation theaters, and dialysis units. We'll go through one by one. Safety of the patients. We should have, a, if we are accommodating normal patients, we should have a very good filtering, uh, if possible, actually. Uh, so we can have, in our hospital, what we do is we have triage at the admission in the emergency unit, OPD, and also in wards. So if uh, we take care to filter them uh, in ETU and in, uh, in the admission room and OPD as much as possible, but if somebody is missed in the wards, there is another barrier to have them filtered. So we have, we can have questionnaires like on admission, the admission admitting officer has to uh, fill this. The important thing is now we are asking questions about overseas travel, uh, traveling from high risk areas or whether had history of self quarantine or current, uh, coming from quarantine center or had significant contact uh, with the, the kind of patients and uh, uh, the thinking of the high-risk areas, this high-risk area should be updated all the time because the, in the current situation, actually uh, the, the, the situation is changing. The, today we have a set of high-risk uh, areas and tomorrow it might change. 
So it's, it's, it's very much important to have a close collaboration with the regional epidemiologists and the MOH areas and with the virology lab to know the significance areas where the positives are coming from. And this update, this high risk area is, the list is being updated all the, every time, uh, at least two, three times a, day, a week. Then, uh, considering uh, we talked about the filtering and triage, and then if we think the high risk uh, patient, according to the uh, nature of the patient, whether he's, a, uh, whether he's having respiratory symptoms or without respiratory symptoms, we should have isolation units to accommodate those patients. The, respiratory, the high risk patients with respiratory symptoms and high risk patients without respiratory symptoms coming for some other problems like surgical indications or chest pain uh, likewise. And we should have a diagnosis as soon as possible for these patients. And also we have to plan for the action once positive or negative. Then uh, that is kind of uh, have a, uh, the, the barriers we have in the hospital, then we have to have a community screening, the surveillance, and it can be done in OPD setup. And also all these things, we have to have regular reviews and updates, like I said, and meanwhile, we can have raising public awareness by displays, announcements, and also the visitors and bystanders has to be taken care. Uh, you, ha you have to visit, limit visitors and also bystanders. If you can stop bystanders, that is the idea. If you are accommodating bystanders in any case, there should be a bystander screening and visitors should be also, you can have the temperature check uh, at the entrance um, and uh, the issuing passes for the visitors and give strict guidelines to security to accommodate only the uh, visitors with passes. This is the setup, the kind of uh, setup we have in the OPD. Uh, the, there's a uh, the sobbing room the, uh, in the right side of the surveillance and uh, then uh, the signpost for the patients and in the fever corner, fever corner with the uh, maximum protection for the healthcare workers also. Then healthcare worker safety. The all, everything about patient safety uh, are important in assuring healthcare worker safety as well. Because if the patient is secured only, you can assure the healthcare worker safety and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Then we have to have guidelines for safety measures. Uh, the national protocols are issued and they may be adapted to the adapted to suit your institution um, the, according to your setup. Then as Dr. Madhuman has said, we should have a uh, maximum uh, protection with PPE, they are possible, and they are, should be optimized. We should optimize the PPE use. We'll talk about that later. And then again, surveillance, staff screening can be done. We have to have an action plan after a potential exposure to a positive patient or highly suspected patient. And then again, we should have regular reviews raising awareness, updating knowledge among healthcare workers, and also again, the collaboration with the administration and authorities. Regarding PP, uh, we should optimize PP use with one thing, we can minimize the need by, by, by physical barriers and all, and then protocols for rational use and regularize supply chain. Then guidelines for PP indications can be given for the staff, uh, which, is, which can be based on the SP model, that means severity, probability, and the exposure. And uh, you, we can have guidelines on proper use, donning and doffing. Then the better to have in situ, like uh, on the spot workshops without disrupting the normal routines and without having common gatherings. 
he can individualize the teaching and training to suit the particular unit, like emergency unit and ICUs. Then, then and there, we can discuss the practical problems at the same time. So you can have demonstration of PP and other things and skill evaluation also of the healthcare workers. We have done several in the hospital and we are planning to have more. And promoting hand hygiene, you have to emphasize when to do hand hygiene, how to do hand hygiene, and with what, the clarification with the hand soap, the soap and water and alcohol handle, and how long. Always, we can't, one thing you have to remember is we can't avoid exposure to patients. But what we can have is protected exposure. So always promote the concept having protected exposure. That is the most important thing. Then we have to uh, establish good diagnostics, biological services. We have, to, if you have biological services already functioning, you have to strengthen the laboratory or consider establishing if possible. Then monitor the other sections of the laboratory, avoid interruptions and assure the staff with safety measures and guidelines and also limit non-agent urgent expenditures like buying new machines for something else, if not really necessary for the time being, avoid wastage and use resources carefully and improve the communication network among the hospital wards, units and the laboratory. It is also really important to update the, uh, uh, the results, uh, especially with the isolation units. Then uh, the issue, we have to assure the safety of the other uh, people who are doing diagnostics and therapies like radiographers, ECG technicians, opticians, physiotherapy staff, and the other supporting staff. We, we should be able to clarify doubts and issue guidelines and update their knowledge. Many problems occur due to lack of knowledge, how, to, and the, how the virus is being transmitted and what PP should be worn like that. And we have to facilitate the isolation wards, ETU and ICUs with mobile machines and on-call staff to reduce the patient movements. Then regarding the surveillance, staff screen. This can be voluntary or mandatory. Voluntary may be for the symptomatic staff or asymptomatic staff, mandatory, is after a potential exposure. And sometimes we recommend screening for the people coming from high-risk units or for the healthcare workers coming from high-risk or lockdown areas, the periodical screening. The, it's better to have separate slots and timing for staff screening to avoid uh, the staff exposure to the patients and ensure their safety and convenience. Also, assure quicker results and assure us that the, the, we should have a method of doing counseling for the healthcare workers. And ensure easy approach towards microbiologists, virologists, or on call VP for clarifications. Then uh, the action after the a potential exposure to a COVID patient. We have to have a team for making decisions. That is multidisciplinary team. Consists of physicians, microbiologists, virologists, administration, and the special grade nursing officers. There should be an immediate response plan. If you find a positive patient in a normal ward, what you should do? Close the ward, stop admissions, and uh, alert the uh, uh, particular authorities like that, you have to have an immediate response plan. That can be done, uh, taken by the administration with the multidisciplinary team. Then the subsequent decisions regarding the index patient, other patients and the involved staff members can be done based on the risk assessment. And you have to uh, give clear protocols on how to clean the unit after um, uh, having the index patient to a separate unit. 
and better to have individual institutional protocols based on the national protocol to uh, uh, clarify the, to have a clear guidance uh, for the hospital. This is the kind of the, the, the protocol we have in ours that is based on the national protocol, national guideline, and we have adapted into uh, to suit our situation, our setup in Parapitia. The, there are five critical questions we are asking uh, from a healthcare worker uh, who uh, was potentially exposed to a positive patient. Whether had face-to-face -face contact within one meter with a confirmed or probable patient for more than without having a surgical face mask or whether they had waiting tears without wearing onto the mucous membrane uh, from a confirmed or probable patient, whether had any healthcare interactions like handling VHTs, the bed head tickets or handling patients equipments uh, uh, without appropriate personal protective equipment uh, and other necessary precautions. So if you answers, if you answer no for all the questions, then your risk is actually very much low. You can continue work with appropriate PP, but if you develop symptoms, have a low threshold to do PCR. If you have any yes, to any kind of any any question, any any question out of this file, with regards to a probable case, then you become a, a healthcare worker with moderate risk. But if you have a single yes out of these five questions against confirmed case, then you are uh, belong to high risk category. So uh, then we consider quarantine after the PCR. The, then we talk about the emergency preparedness uh, with special facilities. In a, in a normal hospital, in a uh, pay, hospital where you don't have positive COVID patients, uh, you are not treating for positive COVID patients, then, but you can have positive patients needing emergency surgical care, dialysis care, or ICU care. So you have to have a plan. What operation theater you should have? What ICU bed you should accommodate? What dialysis machine you should use? So all these things should have emergency protocols. Strict guidelines on preparedness, procedures, and decontamination, subsequent decontamination. Decontamination may be personal, instrument, and environment should be issued. And all the contact events, if you are doing a kind of a surgery or a procedure um, to a positive patient, then all the contact events should be recorded and close supervision of staff involved in emergency procedure should be ensured. That is, this is very important in subsequent contact tracing and risk assessment and management if the need arises. This is the, uh, the, the, the painting guideline to, uh, for surgical procedures in a COVID patient, COVID positive patient. Still, uh, we are preparing the guideline. And other measures like facilitating hand hygiene for all patients, healthcare workers and visitors at the entrances in the clinics, uh, in, in wards, uh, in uh, uh, common uh, places. And uh, like I said earlier, visitor bystander screening. Then you have to think of other uh, the mortuary as well, regularize the mortuary proceedings, disposal of dead bodies and taking samples. You have to regularize, give uh, uh, guidance. Then we have to create protocols with backup workforce and backup hospital space to be deployed for anticipated uh, COVID surge in waves. Right? What, what, what? The, they are to be back up, always back up uh, workforce and hospital space, right? where possible. 
and all these should be should have regular reviews and meanwhile you can have raise awareness uh, raising awareness and updating the knowledge among healthcare workers and always you should have a very good collaboration with the administration and authorities so that's a kind of out, over, uh, the overview we can have about the hospital preparedness thank you and be prepared and stay safe thank you dr bagya for that excellent presentation uh, now we have come to the end of this session before that uh, there are some questions from the audience i think most of the questions have been handled by dr madhumani uh, at the moment most of the questions were related to the reuse and maybe about cleaning whether to clean it soap and water or what are the how many times that has to be reused and there were several concerns raised related to the quality of the mask and how to quality assure before we wind up can dr madhumani comment on the questions even though you might uh, have uh, answered most of them it may be useful for the viewers okay sir so actually mask is the most important part of our uh, personal protective equipment uh, so um, i had a good reading recently uh, because i wrote an article on uh, mask and i know that uh, the uh, surgical mask of course um, need to have three layers and a very good nose uh, metal piece which can seal the mask on your face properly although it has gaps it does not give uh, aerosol uh, generating uh, the protection for aerosol generating uh, procedure but apart from that it gives a good uh, assurance um, and worn with a shield will give a uh, very good protection uh, apart from aerosol generating procedure so aerosol generating procedure is the problem actually where we need to have um, n95 mask a ffp2 quality mask or equal so this equal does not mean although i, I also had the impression at the beginning uh, for a few months ago that uh, in kn95 gives the same protection but uh, reading and uh, learning a lot it seems that many k95 mask uh, do not meet the uh, required standards because it does not filter 95% uh, th those uh, you all can go into cdc guidelines and all where they have tested many masks uh, k95 and other uh, respirator so called respirators uh, some have passed about 95 but each and everything you had to check i mean i know it is difficult i i know it would have been better if we had a good system to check all the uh, the quality of mask and other personal protective equipment we get into our country as in uh, uh, america really and uh, european countries uh, but uh, in our um, college of microbiologist guidelines we have given the recommendation what should be there uh, when you get a surgical and uh, uh, respirator surgical mask and respirators uh, but due to the availability i think we have gone for um, what is available that is the problem uh, so hope uh, ministry will take up and will do some quality testing and uh, make uh, sure until then because i have uh, listened to one uh, who uh, we me now on this kind of similar things where they also suggested use the face shield with the mask you wearing because uh, the uh, n95 mask also should be a respiratory like a surgical n95 mask which does not allow uh, humidity uh, water it is not permeable for droplets so permeability problems also there we don't know what we are getting so you can block droplets definitely by a face shield so whenever you perform a procedure i really recommend to wear a face shield on whatever you wear uh, surgical or uh, a respirator k95 because it is the one available as you have seen actually i can show you the quality of some things because this is some um, if you can see this is a uh, um, supposed to be a 95 mask i had some times ago um from hospital uh, so it does not have any 
uh, names or anything. So this is a counterfeit one. Uh, this can't be an N95 mask, although it has the shape. So we have this problem because N95 mask should have the numbers and uh, so new certification and their numbers and several uh, things on the face. Uh, and uh, you can check these numbers with the websites. Um, so that's actually what I can say. But uh, I think uh, in Sri Lanka, we have a company where we have checked, uh, when I was working in Matale Hospital, we have checked several masks. We have sent uh, to the company. I won't say the name of the company. Um, they have checked it free, free of charge, although they charge normally because it's a hospital. They did have to for us freely, we, they checked about a lot of masks uh, where they have given uh, the uh, mask we have seen that time, uh, they met uh, like uh, N95 mask definitely met the filtering uh, capacity, but they checked only filtering uh, facility, not otherwise, because you had to check several things when you check a mask, not only the filtering uh, facility, um, other things as well. Thank you, Dr. Madhubani, for your explanation. I think it has clarified most of the doubts. And uh, there were some concerns raised about the, the quality and quality assurance and, and the related issues. Probably this may be something that we can forward it to the authorities and the technical committees and maybe take necessary action. I think uh, with a limited time available, we'll bring this session to a close now. I'd like to thank all the speakers, the two speakers, and especially the Shaka College of Microbiologists for providing the necessary resource and the expertise for this very important seminar. And the World Health Organization for co-organizing this important series of webinars. And this is the first webinar and we'll be having a series of weekly webinars in important selected topics related to COVID-19. And uh, the session will be available as a video in our YouTube and social media platforms and will be used for, the, used for our continuous development, professional development platforms as well. Now I would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Nadira Karunavira, the president of the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists for her concluding remarks. Over to you, Dr. Nadira. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Indika. Uh, th uh, I think it was a wonderful opportunity for all of us. Uh, it was a pleasure collaborating with SLMA and I would like to thank SLMA and WHO for this uh, initiative, which is very important uh, during this period. I'm sure uh, all the health workers at, of all categories would have benefited through this experience. And let me also thank the resource persons uh, for their very valuable inputs and uh, participants for their active participation. Thank you.